Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Portcullis House for tonight's discussion, Does Your Country Have the Right to Make You Fight? My name is Katie Jackson and I manage public events at the National Army Museum. It's a privilege for us to partner with the Houses of Parliament and I must first of all sincerely thank all the panellists for agreeing to take part today and second thank you to Chris Blanchett who's at the back um, for being so instrumental in bringing this panel together. This event is the culmination of the National Army Museum's centenary programme this year which focuses on marking the introduction of conscription in 1916. Throughout this year, we've explored the experiences of volunteer and conscripted soldiers fighting alongside each other at the Battle of the Somme, as well as their leisure time away from the front line. We've also looked at the other side and discussed the experiences of those who objected to military service. In July, earlier this year, actor Michael Caine was quoted in the Daily Mirror as saying that his national service made men of us quickly. In a poll at the end of the article, which asked if the UK should bring back military service, 67% of people had voted yes. Whether citizens should serve their country by choice or as a civic duty is one that seems to appear in every decade. Today, our speakers will tell you their views on whether your country has the right to make you fight. After their presentations, we will open the floor to questions. And we encourage you to also tweet your views using the hashtag Army and Society, as this is as much about the public's voice as well as those in positions of power. I will now hand over to our chair, uh, Jonathan Bill, the BBC's defence correspondent. Thank you very much. Great. Um, just to give you a format for the evening, um, each of our speakers will speak for about eight minutes, ten minutes, so I'll interrupt them probably. Um, and then uh, we'll throw it open to questions. I might kick off with the first one because I can't stop myself. And we should aim to finish at about 8.30. Um, so as you uh, heard, um, the subject is uh, an elaboration on the John F. Kennedy quote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country and tonight we're asking that question can you ask can your country ask you does it have a right to ask you to fight for it uh, or to make you fight for it uh, just to give you an introduction quickly to our panel and i'll start on this side i'm terrible with my left and right but it's my left um uh first of all will Ellsworth jones uh was chief reporter uh, and then New York correspondent for the Sunday Times. He covered wars, I might be saying, from Vietnam, Cyprus, Angola, Northern Ireland, El Salvador, and Granada. Yeah. And he published uh, his first book in 2008, which was We Will Not Fight, The Untold Story of World War I's Conscientious Objectors. His second book was on a rather different subject, uh, Banksy, the man behind the wall, published in 2012. Uh, Julian Brazier, many of you uh, will know, he's the Can Canterbury MP. He was a Canterbury Whitstable. That's what I usually call it, yeah, because Whitstable's, well, my, a lot of my supporters. Though. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and he um, is somebody who has been a reservist um, uh, in the what was the Territorial Army, I might say. He served on the Commons Defence Select Committee, and most recently he was uh, a minister in the MOD with a specific focus on uh, the Army Reserves. Uh, on my right now, <laughs> Gisela Stewart, um, Labour mem Member of Parliament for Birmingham, Edge Baston. Um, uh, that hasn't stopped her voting for the Iraq War. Um, for the renewal of Trident, but then I might say that probably most MP, uh, Labour MPs wanted the renewal of Trident in the end, whatever their leader thought. And of course, uh, well known now for uh, being one of the lead campaigners in Britain's withdrawal, for Britain's withdrawal of the European Union. She served on the uh, Commons Defence Select Committee, more recently she um, is now serving on the Intelligence Select Committee, which oversees the work of MI5 and SIS, also known as MI6. So if you want any secrets afterwards, speak to Giza. Um, 
finally, um, well, um, we've got um, Lord Paul Bew, who is a crossbench peer. Um, uh, an acknowledgement of his peerage of the work he did on the Good Friday Agreement. He is also a professor specialising in Irish history at King's College London at the moment. And he is also chairman of the Committee on Standards in Public Life, which is responsible for advising uh, the Prime Minister on ethical standards. So mind your P's and Q's. Um, so, if we can start, uh, first of all, Lord, if you could kick off Thank for you. us. Um, I'm going to be a little bit narrow, at least in my opening remarks, because what I was asked to do for this event was uh, to arise out of the fact that on Parliament's World War I Commemoration Committee was to talk about the Irish dimension of, of this question of conscription. Uh, um, and the first thing I want to say to you is that if you go to Westminster Hall, and you look at MPs of all parties and see, you know, the Conservative, Liberal, Labour and so on, there are as many proportionately as Irish MPs who either died or whose sons died in the war, uh, in the First World War. So the thing, and, and this is not perhaps really understood, but a significant part of nationalist Ireland rightly or wrongly rallied to the British, rallied to the British cause in the First World War. However, once conscription becomes a key issue, and by the way, it's very understandable why you quite easily believe 10 more divisions will tip the war our way, and roughly that's the 10 divisions we're not getting out of Ireland. It's quite a rational thing for members of Parliament to believe. Uh, uh, and that's why then again, especially after the uh, Brest and Tops, the, the, the German soldiers are freed from Russia, uh, and uh, uh, can, can be applied. Uh, elsewhere, it, it, it's quite understandable the reason why many people in Ireland and Britain believe that conscription uh, for Ireland was right. And let me explain one of the good arguments for what was obviously a failing argument. Well, we, let's be clear: this is Ireland is enjoying all the benefits of welfare state. So every Irish person, their grandma is got the old age pension, just like in, in Blackburn. So that's one very obvious thing. That there is an equality of citizenship and at least a delivery of whatever the emotional perception of Irish people about the lay of home rule is. There's the equality of delivery from the Ireland is actually subsidized by 19th century, I think it's very arguable it was overtaxed. Uh, um, but by this point in time, Ireland is actually subsidized by Westminster. Um, why do Irish people not want to join up? There's nationalism, nationalist sentiment, the Easter Rising, the execution of the leaders, a huge mistake, although I also regard as unbelievable in the context of the First World War, the Rising launched in association with our gallant allies, Imperial Germany, as they said explicitly, that, uh, in which 500 people died, that there aren't actually going to be executions. It's such an obvious ob ob leadership. I regard as the, the proposition that it was disastrous politically because of its emotional effect on Ireland is true. The proposition that the British state could say to people in the trenches, you must die at a moment's notice, but actually you have this chaps do this thing in Dublin alliance with Germany and actually nobody's going to suffer. It's not, you know, just to put yourself back in that moment, it's not really credible either. There's no question after the rising there's an emotional shift towards nationalism. I would actually say that although many people stress the threat of conscription is explained why nationalism becomes more extreme. If you look at the by-elections, it's there certainly before the formal statute on conscription in the spring of 1918. The moderate nationalist party is already losing by-elections in a big way before conscription becomes a decisive issue. But there are other reasons other than nationalist sentiment why Irish people don't want to join out. One is snobbery. The Irish Catholics who join are cut in towns. By, or, or the larger rural towns, and lot working class. Um, most of Ireland is rural. Farmers is very class stratified society. Um, farmers' sons do not welcome the idea of being in the same position in the ranks as agricultural labourers. It's very simple. So it's not just patriotism and rejection of Britain and move towards a, you know, a lower nationalist position. It is actually snobbery. It is also a determination not to, um, a, a determination to benefit from the fact that the First World War is great for Irish agriculture. 
it's just tremendous prices rise people have to be fed in these cities if you've got a farm you're doing really well so money and snobbery is actually a significant part of the reason why uh, I, I truly accept these questions of national identity but it's powerful other implements which are money and snobbery which are often as important to people's lives and national identity of course people see there is this sense among young men people, young men are having a venture of war and that feeds into the IRA but I'll have my adventure of war at home I'll have the benefit of surprise I'll shoot the local policeman uh, that's a lot better than I'll, I'll probably sleep in my own bed that's what the IRA mostly does. There's very few. There's a few set piece encounters with the British Army, but mostly it's that sort of a war. Um, much more. So young men are. That's how the displacement. That's so people don't join up and want and they want to have their adventure of war under you know in, in, in Ireland itself. And that's what feeds into the IRA, and this is what really essentially happens here. Uh, um, that, that these are, you know, quite. A, I'm, I'm giving a slightly cynical perspective on this, but I actually do believe all these things. And I'm not disputing the emotions of nationalism or desire for Irish Republic has been real. There's a fa the most famous IRA song in this period is called The Foggy Jew. It's written by a Catholic clergyman in Paul's Road Catholic Church. And The Foggy Jew says that it's better to die under an Irish sky than at Suvla. And, 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 and by the way, huge Irish losses at, at, at Gallipoli, underestimated proportionately more than the more famous Australian losses. And it's moderate Ireland, moderate Catholic and Protestant Ireland, which dies in thousands at Gallipoli. And then the very people, another reason why Sinn Féin sweeps the board from 1917 to Irish Dutch, which got more extreme, is the very people who would have opposed that die, uh, die at Gallipoli. Uh, Churchill's project, of course, in some respects. Now, what Churchill, Churchill looks back at this and he says, although he was strongly for conscription, and he was also at the start of the Second World War until he recalled this, he says, actually, it was a dreadful mistake because we had 60,000 troops in Ireland trying to extract 60,000 recruits that we never got. So self-evidently, this is, this is what Churchill says after. At the time, he was like everybody else, or large parts of British ruling really class, believing that conscription was a, a viable project. So what it all reveals is that in the Second World War, some of you may not be aware, for example, in Northern Ireland, there was no conscription, even though it's part of the United Kingdom. And my mother, who joined British Army, is a doctor from County Cork, Catholic, was a volunteer, but so was my father, who joined it in Belfast. No conscriptions. Again, Churchill's immediate thing was, we ought to have conscription, this is ridiculous. Uh, um, and uh, Northern Ireland benefiting the British welfare state and so on. And then he backed off because of what he considered to be a lessons of the First World War. So the Irish case does demonstrate clearly the difficulties and the dangers of conscription when you do not have agreement about what your national identity is. And I accept this. I accept that those, if you look at one of the MPs who died, Tom Kettle, whose name is on the, on the uh, in Westminster Hall, Kettle makes speeches during the war where he talks about we, and the we is Britain and Ireland. Um, that's very unusual. The, the use of we to mean anything by an Irish national, to mean anything other than Irish nationals, is very, very unusual. And my argument is, you know, I accept that it's that was a minority turn, always fragile, and was ultimately absolutely displaced, eclipsed by the First World War. So the crucial questions of identity are there. But I have to say, and this I think might feed into other discussions about conscription and, and so on, it isn't just morality, I am an Irish nationalist, I reject British imperialism. It is also snobbery and self-interest, which explains what happens in Ireland in that period. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, Julian, can you get it? Yes, of course. Jonathan, I'm going to take a sort of middle position in this. It seems to me self-evident that a state has the right to call people out um, when it's severely threatened. Uh, but I want to argue that um, the um, conscription is not generally a very effective way of putting together the fighting element of armed forces, unless you're in a country with a long history of it. In the build-up of the First World War, and indeed in the second, countries like Germany and France, who had had conscription for generations, so uh, most males had been through the, arm, the armed forces, well, the army, um, were able to build extremely successful um, armies out of it. But the English-speaking experience uh, 
Hindu-speaking world has never had conscription for long, for significant periods. We'd had the Navy in the Napoleonic era. Um, it was very different. In the Great War, as we were reminded earlier, we started without conscription. In fact, um, the, at the beginning of the Battle of the Somme, we had a million men stood to um, to go over the top the night before it started. There wasn't a single man listed AWOL that night. It was one of the, it was the most extraordinarily brave and determined force, whatever the quality of the generalship. And it's, I think, interesting to reflect um, just how much that declined between the two wars. The, um, the territorial force at the beginning of the war was two and a half, was a called for a million, about one and two thirds times the size of the regular, very small regular army we had. And the um, Kitchener arrived dismissing the reserves that we had with the famous quote about them being a, a, a town clerk's army. Um, but he was prevailed upon by Parliament to uh, use the reserves, and Sir John French said, without the assistance which the territorials afforded between October 1914 and June 1915, i.e. at the very beginning of the war, it would have been impossible to hold the line in France and Belgium. And they provided, in fact, about 40% of the um, fighting units in the war. Uh, the units that came alongside them were also volunteer citizen units until more than halfway through the war, raised very often by those very Lord Mayors who, who uh, Kitchener had derided. The fighting spirit of that army was truly tremendous. You contrast that with the Second World War, where we, we went into it with a territorial force that was an absolute shadow of what it had been in 1914, almost completely untrained with no resources, and, the, and much smaller. Um, we adopted conscription from the very beginning, in fact, from before the onset of war. So we poured huge numbers of citizens into a, a very different structure. And it's, I mean, it's interesting to reflect. You read, we were beaten very easily in France and Norway. You read Rommel's accounts of fighting the Eighth Army, and they read very much like our accounts of fighting the Italians. Um, Field Marshal Montgomery commented on the eve of a battle of Al El Alamein when we had overwhelming numbers on our side against an exhausted German army with Rommel, of course, ill in Austria. Um, there have been, he, of course, a gallant First World War veteran himself, there have been far too many unwounded prisoners taken in this war. We must impress on our officers, NCOs and men. When they're cut off, they must hold out where they are. And across the board, we were only able to beat Germans where we had numbers overwhelmingly on our side, except in small elite movements. German, people from American journalists through to Joe Stalin contrasted the extraordinary difference between the British Army in the Second World War and the RAF, where, of course, all the fighting elements were 100% volunteer who put in an unbelievable effort by any standards and saved us where the army had failed, basically, in the Battle of Britain. Interestingly, 50% reservist at the outbreak of the war. Trenchard believed in reserves in the way the army chiefs of staff hadn't between the wars. Um, very interesting, too, to draw parallels with the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth used the same volunteer model that we used in the bulk of the First World War in both world wars. Rommel's first experience of hitting the Australians at, uh, on the outskirts of Tobruk um, an absolutely green, 100% citizen unit with no professional soldiers commanded by a school teacher, a general who was a school teacher. Um, the enemy fought with remarkable tenacity. Even the wounded went on de defending themselves. People have often, Max Hastings, one of many, asked why were the Dominion troops so much better in the Second World War? It seemed to me self-evident because they were volunteers. They had conscripts, but they didn't send them to the main theatres of war, not until almost the very end of it. The most extreme example of this is Vietnam, where America, um, the National Guard lobby for the only time in its history, went to, uh, lobbied the President not to call out the National Guard because they felt there wasn't popular support. The Pentagon rubbed its hands, a chance to go to war without the amateurs. So they, they used the regular army as the framework for expansion, it's put vast numbers of conscripts in, and the rest is history.
Actually, it's not history, just history. Out of that came the Abrahams Doctrine, that they will never again go to war without reserve units alongside their, their regular ones. At one point in Iraq, 54% of the total land forces there were, and a large part of the Air Force too, were National Guard. Um, if you look around the English-speaking world today, this is all extremely well understood. Under, under its uh, plans, the, Na the National Guard and USAR will rise from 50 to 54 percent of the total American army. Uh, in Australia and Canada, the numbers between a third and two fifths. In Britain, we're just starting to move back in that direction. It'll be 27 percent of the, of the total strength. And I think it's very important to realize this is not just about providing a framework for expansion. It's also about the link with the wider civilian community. A professional army in a country with no conscription and no history of it loses contact with, its civilian, with the civilian world very easily. The British Army is particularly prone to that because it's concentrated, and indeed all three of our services are concentrated increasingly on a very small number of large bases. We don't quite have the footprint the National Guard enjoy with a, with a presence in every major community in America. But our reserves have a, have a, a, a centre in half the parliamentary constituencies. Very sobering thought if we want to do it. So I would argue that while conscription is obviously morally justifiable, and clearly you need conscripts, um, and even the Dominions in both world wars use them for all sorts of jobs at home, um, the core of the fighting elements of your army, you have to have a much more realistic way of expanding it. And in a country without conscription, that has to be through effective, healthy, well-led, citizen-led volunteer reserves. Um, because we may need them again sooner than we think. It was, after all, it was Plato who said, only the dead have seen the end of war. Thank you, Julie. Geese. Thank you very much. Uh, I can argue a whole range of cases <laughs> for reasons I shall explain. Uh, I was born in Munich, uh, and I now have Neville Chamberlain's old constituency in Birmingham, Edgbaston. And I sometimes have these imaginary conversations with him, uh, which says that in 1997, your seat will be represented by a woman, a socialist, and one born in Munich. But don't worry, it's all perfectly peaceful. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that, that whole kind of argument. So, so the second thing is, I'm not just German by birth, I'm actually Bavarian. Uh, remember, the Bavarians fought with uh, Napoleon against the Prussians. Uh, so the question of who is we is actually really important, and who we is is not always defined, and it can shift over time. And the third thing is uh, I have the Center for Defense Medicine in my constituency. So for the last 15 years, every injured soldier, whether in Iraq or Afghanistan, would end up in my patch. And uh, I have quite a lot of, to do with the families and the Fisher houses where the families then visit. So. So I can sort of see the whole, whole range of arguments. And I would say in terms of is it ever justified, it, it kind of is, it depends on the circumstances and it depends on what you think the function of, this, the, function of the state is. I mean, it's quite interesting to go on uh, the website and to scroll down to countries who still have got conscription. And some of them will have cons conscription as a clear sign of suppression. Uh, some of East Africa, where the, you know, is, is the parts of Somalia where you, you know you join you join the parts of Ethiopia, you join the army, and you're not let out until you're at least 40, and it becomes a, a it becomes a function of state control. As I can see, it, uh, the, in, in, in Britain, because you don't have a standing army or tradition of a standing army, uh, it's always been seen as a, a fairly um, inefficient way of training your, your, your soldiers. Uh, and it wasn't seen as the thing to provide the, the kind of cohesion for your society, which is seen in other societies. Um, it's, I, I was reading, if because I, I get slightly fed up with all these historic things, and it's all about men. So uh, if, if you really want to read about uh, some of the debates uh, on conscription, you know, Margot asked with his diaries are uh, uh, really very in interesting because it's this whole period of where the debate about conscription ha uh, happens and they should be made. And uh, there's this moment, there was an independent um, 
pro there was a by-election, the victory of the pro-conscription candidate Stanton at Merthyr Tidwell by-election in November knocked a good deal of nonsense out of the national debate about compulsion. And the reason why this was important was this was a Labour candidate who was actually uh, campaigning for conscription. And it also defeated that notion that conscription was something that disproportionately hit the poor. Uh, actually, a de debate which, you know, and, and Julian will knows better, which has come back when it comes to recruitment, mm -hmm. uh, where some parts where actually schools were objecting to uh, the, the forces going in for recruitment because they were saying you're just recruiting the poor. Uh, and I think in times of national emergency, uh, the greater the threat to your country, uh, the more the argument for conscription becomes an argument for being prepared. Uh, so if you go and do your searches, you will find that Lithuania is uh, going back to prescription and that was following the events in the Ukraine. You will find that Sweden is contemplating uh, starting conscription. Uh, Sweden is not even a NATO member. So when there's a nature of a threat to which a, a nation that can say we feels it needs to collectively respond, then you actually go back to what is the first duty of the nation state. The first duty of the nation state is defense of the realm. And quite frankly, if it does not defend the realm, then it has no right to exist in my book, quite frankly, because you only have any right to take money out of my back pocket, which you call tax, uh, if you do some basic things to me, for me. And the most basic thing is, is the defense. But of course, that requires uh, a mechanisms of consensus. And I think it's interesting to just think a little bit about this and it, going back to wearing my, my German hat um, you know Immanuel Kant and uh, that whole philosophy of the nation state always assumed that the collective of the nation state has greater right than those which are given to them by the people the state itself its entity requires rights and therefore it can demand things from its people the thing which uh, I always loved about the Brits uh, and some may accuse me of being a sort of sentimental foreigner, but I, I, I really don't think it is, is that the people are only give the power to those in power for as long as they think they want to give it to them, and no further powers than that. The checks and balances of the British constitutional settlement is the parliament has those powers given to them. They cannot demand powers. And I would say that actually the, the, the referendum, quite frankly, was one of the most glaring examples of uh, that sovereignty actually doesn't lie in Parliament. Parliament has sovereignty over the Crown, but it doesn't have sovereignty over the people. The people actually regard that they ultimately are the sovereign. And that's a system I'm instinctively by far more comfortable with, because I think the state should only have, have rights over the individual when they can explain it. I'll give you the classic example of when we had the last debate over ID cards. I had a, a, a busload of German students in the House of Commons and they just looked at me in utter despair. They said, what is your problem with carrying a piece of paper? And yet, wherever you go in this country, you have CCTV cameras. Don't they trouble you? And they thought our use of CCTV cameras was absolutely outrageous, total infringement of civil liberties. And how could we think they were right, but that piece of paper was not right? And it was simply a very utilitarian argument, is that whenever anything happens, the majority of the British public goes and shouts, you mean there's no camera footage? A mugging happened and you had no cameras there? Because we, we believe in the, in the checks and balances, whereas with ID cards, they weren't convinced. So in terms of conscription, there will always be the argument as to what is most efficient. And I remember there were these huge, I remember having a big debate about this with, with, with Chef Hoon when he was Defense Secretary, uh, which was at the time when the Germans just stopped conscription. And the argument, as the Germans were phasing it out, was that, uh, well, it, it gives us a really good look at some of the, the kind of sort of the first tranche of apprentices. We, we, we managed to get a look at these guys for about 18 months or 24 months. And then if they really want to join uh, the regular army, we, we already know them. And the, 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 the British response to that was, that may well be true, but this is just about the most inefficient way they could think of, of recruiting your forces. But then, of course, takes me to when would you because I was kind of thinking, when would you, in the current system, 
get back to your 1960, that you would have a threat, a threat to these islands, which would be demanded to be sufficiently serious that you could have a serious conscription, a, 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 a serious debate where a parliament would vote for conscription. And I have to say, I would find that really, really difficult to imagine such a set of circumstances. I spent this uh, honest this day, the, 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 the church service on Sunday, in, in, in a small church in Worcestershire, where they actually, at the beginning of the church service, were reading out all the family names of those fallen. And I thought it's interesting that actually from that you can't tell which of them were the volunteers who eagerly went and those who really rather would not have gone but had no choice but nevertheless gave their lives. And I thought it was remarkable that, uh, that, that there was a kind of collective honour of those who gave their lives irrespective of, of, of how that choice was made. And the big difference again to me when I first came to this country, which is now sort of 40 odd years ago, was of course that military action uh, and war has never been seen as an act of failure as a nation. There is a glory associated with, uh, with war, uh, which I think uh, Iraq has changed, the family's reaction to Iraq has changed, I think the debates of Afghanistan have changed it, and you think the, the way we're now responding to, to Libya and Syria, and to what extent we think giving uh, blood and treasure as a response to a threat where is, is shifting at that. Uh, but as a, wearing sort of my, my German hat, uh, it was quite interesting that nevertheless in Germany, conscription was accepted until very recently as a, a duty to the nation. Uh, and therefore, I think if we, if we were kind of looking ahead, the debates which we had in, in, in 1916, I don't think we could have again. I think we'd have a, we wouldn't have a problem with the de definition of we. Uh, I think we wouldn't have a problem of the definition of the threat. But I do think we would have a problem in terms of this place across the road. What the referendum taught me in a very curious way was I couldn't understand after the referendum why we had a 72% you know, turnout and a 3.8% majority. That seems by any other electoral measures to be a clear result. And I, and I couldn't understand why the response was one of anger and one where the defeated side demanded that the winners explain themselves. You know, the reaction was, you better explain yourself, you know. What have you just done? You've just won. And I thought it's because we fight, polit we fight elections in a tri as a tribe, but not referenda. So the tribe that wins has a responsibility to implement the result, and the tribe that loses can huddle together and comfort itself. And I think the party political divisions in attitude to military action, I don't think, I mean, unless Julian disagrees me, I don't think it's falling along party lines the way you would. No, it's expected. Not, it's not, you're quite right. So any decisions which would go, whether it's going to war or defence, I think the natural tribes in which we come into this place would fragment in a way which would make the decision-making process, which would the result then in a national consensus, really quite difficult. So I kind of look at it as something that was a historic debate in extremis, and it would have to be a old-fashioned warfare in extremis, I think you could have it again. But the nature of threat would have to be so obvious and so immediate and so personal, I'd find it difficult that either the, the, the forces would regard it as the most effective way, an efficient way of training its people, nor do I think we could actually get the consent to get it through. I just, should just say that we are expecting uh, somebody else to join us, but I'll introduce them when and if they arrive. But, um, Will, if you could carry on, that'd be great. Well, I disagree with Jesus about the referendum. Um, I uh, do agree with you. The, uh, <coughs> the likelihood of um, conscription getting through Parliament today is, is I think, quite slim. Nevertheless, I'm going to argue the case that um, the state does have the right to send its citizens to war, but it is a conditional right. 
conditioned on the basis the state also has to give citizens the right not to fight. Um, I think it's a diff difficult balance to, to, to meet, but in um, two world wars, somehow or other, we managed to achieve it. Um, and I, in doing the research for my book, I realized how ignorant I was about uh, conscription, particularly in 1914, in the First World War. I, well, I, I thought that what happened was Kitchener's poster was put up everywhere saying, your country needs you, and everyone volunteered, because they did. Um, there were 500,000 men volunteered in the first two months, and 1.4 million volunteered in the first six months. And in fact, um, at one stage, it was not um, your, does your country have the right to make you fight, it was does your country have the right to stop you fighting. Uh, Kitchener at one point had to raise the height limit and raise the chest limit so he could reduce the number of people volunteering um, because the army simply couldn't cope. Um, and it, it was an amazing occurrence that, that, that there were too many men for the army to deal with. But of course, it didn't last. The, the war was supposed to be over by Christmas. It didn't. Uh, and it started devouring men. Come 1915, um, there was <coughs> the Liberal government was faced with the fact that it was going to have to ask for conscription, something that it had been against all along. Um, and it was uh, Asquith, Herbert Asquith, who eventually had to introduce it. The first draft of his military service bill uh, had no reference to conscientious objectors. The second draft did. Um, and he introduced it in an, an amazing sort of time. I mean, he was to lose his oldest son in the war um, in the next year. Parliament in those days, I think there were 630 members, and about 130, 140 of them were in the armed forces. And most of them uh, were in the Commons when he introduced it in uniform. Uh, nevertheless, he introduced the bill um, allowing exemption from military service for conscientious objectors. And that was a truly remarkable. Uh, act to, as pe particularly in that context, it wasn't recognised as such by everyone. Um, the Daily Mail reported, the biggest outburst of incredulous and contemptuous cries came at the news that conscientious objectors were to be released from combatant service. The laughter was long and loud. Nevertheless, the bill passed by 300, including the conscientious objection clause, by 383 votes to 36. Um, and compared, comparing it with the continent, from what I could see, France, there wasn't time, there wasn't time to, for um, conscience to be, to be considered. Um, in Germany, the Mennonites, um, for some strange historical reason that I, I never quite um, f discovered, were allowed to plead conscience, and that was it. Um, so higgledy-piggledy, we did have some sort of law that allowed conscience. Um, although it, it was, so what it said was, there isn't an absolute right for the government to send men, citizens to war, but there is a right. And it was higgledy-piggledy. There were um, a tribunal set up um, who had to judge they had to judge many things. They were sort of on questions of health. You could plead health problems. You could plead business problems. But you could also plead conscience problems. Uh, conscience problems. Conscience that re you refuse to fight. Um, They're under enormous pressure. Um, and they uh, were sometimes uh, ridiculous. I, I, I remember someone in Middlesex was told, uh, he was a socialist and thus he couldn't have a conscience and he was not exempted. 
Yeah. Most <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the most uh, ridiculous case um, I could remember was a piano tuner in London. Um, and he was asked, um, could he assure the tribunal that the pianos he tuned were not going to be used in any way in any military gathering by the military? Um, he couldn't assure the tribunal of what was going to happen to the, his pianos, and his, his application for exemption was uh, declined. Um, <laughs> ridiculously, obviously. Um, so there were cases where people were sent to uh, the non-combatant corps, which was called the No Courage Corps, certain <laughs> soon nicknamed that, um, to the Friends Ambulance Unit. But what the army couldn't stand, understandably, was people who refused to do anything um, for the war effort, the absolutists. And the army took the first 35 of them, uh, they'd refused to obey orders in England, took them to France, where they'd be uh, on active service, where they would face a field general court-martial, tried them, found them guilty, and sentenced them to death. And again, it was only um, Asquith's intervention that saved them from um, being executed. Uh, and they uh, were given 10 years hard labor, which most of them came out in 1919. 1939, conscription again. Um, Neville Chamberlain had been um, head of the tribunal in the First World War, so he knew how they worked and how they didn't work. Uh, and it was a much more, uh, it certainly wasn't wonderful, but it was a much more reasonable system. Um, and in fact, it's interesting, in the First World War, there were 16,500 conscientious objectors, of whom about 6,000 went to prison for some length of time. In the Second World War, there were 62,000 conscientious objectors, including 1,000 women, of whom 3,000 men and women went to prison uh, for a length of time. Um, I'm not sure. I, my own belief is that there would have been more conscientious objectors in the First World War, but they, the system was not as sympathetic to them as, they, as it was in the Second World War. And again, looking at the continent, um, we mistreated Jehovah's Witnesses. About 1,500 of them went to jail. In Germany, about 270 were simply executed. Um, there was no there was no place for conscientious objectors. Um, it's now been 56 years since, since conscription, we last had conscription. Uh, there aren't, um, I hope there'll never be a sort of land war where the numbers will be required at the same sort of numbers they required in those two wars. And as, as I say, I have doubts about whether such a bill would uh, ever pass Parliament. Um, but I do wonder how we, how I, how we would all react. And I remember um, in looking at a case in Doncaster in 1916, um, a Methodist school teacher was called before a tribunal. Um, and he was asked all kinds of hypothetical questions. And one of them was, supposing you were in a corner with your back to the wall and six men were before you with open sword or fixed banyet, would you not do something if you had a revolver in your hand? And the school teacher replied, the sixth commandment says, thou shalt not kill. I take it it is better to be killed than kill anyone else. I think if I had been asked that, question in a tribunal, I'd have been very nervous, but I might have first of all said, well, could I surrender? Um, and if I couldn't say that, I would have said, well, I would have tried to shoot my way out in a sort of James Bond um, cowboy vision that I would have failed miserably. So I'm not a pacifist, but I do believe 
that while a country has a right to make you fight, it also has a has a duty and the, and the right a duty to allow people to follow their conscience. Thanks. And um, we've just been joined by. Kirsten Oswald, so thanks Kirsten for coming along. Uh, Kirsten, for those um, who don't know her, is the MP for East Renfrewshire. Uh, uh, she's um, also the SNP spokesperson for the Armed Forces and Veterans. So uh, we've arrived just in time <laughs> to have your turn. So what we'd seen, thank, thank you very much, and I apologise to everyone for the, the lateness of my arrival, but I'm glad I did make it just in, in the nick of time. Uh, and it's a really interesting proposition to, to come and, and talk to you about. It certainly left me scratching my head uh, a bit uh, when I was thinking about it. Does do your country have the, the right to make your fight? I actually think it's quite a complicated question. Uh, and you know, certainly if you look at where we are now, nothing is surer in, in politics and in the world in general than the fact that we simply don't actually know what happens next. Every day is different, every hour sometimes actually is different and unexpected. And I think that does matter in the context of this debate today because we, we simply can't, in my view anyway, make a blanket statement on this topic. I don't think that's possible uh, because I don't think we can reasonably expect it to cover all eventualities in the world today or in the future, uh, which is looking more impossible to predict. And I think that it's very clear that what held true 100 years ago is very far from certain these days. Uh, I think that the context that we would ask the question in is very different to the one we would have been operating in a century ago. Uh, all of the certainties have changed, all the expectations have changed, uh, the, the structure of society itself is it very much changed from what would have been familiar to people looking at army service then, and the world looks very different uh, as, as a whole. Uh, and I think that's true uh, from the perspective of those who would ask the question, does, does your country have the, the right to make you fight, and also to those who would be called to serve, and I think that's uh, an important point. But I do think it's interesting to reflect a little bit on the, the situation a century ago uh, before we look at, at where we are now and where we might find ourselves going in the future. Um, and, and while 100 years ago it was the first time the army uh, had introduced conscription, it wasn't the first conscription to, to British forces, so you would think to some extent people would be familiar with the, the concept, uh, but, but even still, you know, while the, the your country needs you phrase might very well have been true, uh, and so many people did sign up and, uh, and took heed of that, there simply weren't enough people who felt that they particularly were who their country needed. So that there was obviously no alternative but to press for conscription because there was clearly a need for huge levels of manpower and that was the situation that the country was in. Uh, and, you know, for, for today, uh, I'll leave aside the, the military tactics and the, the judgments that, that led to the need for this very vast requirement for manpower. Uh, this is actually what I had studied at university, but that was a long, long time ago. But uh, I remember enough to know that it's a whole other debate and could take us some considerable time to, uh, to get through. But it, clearly there are, are some views that would suggest that, that the population 100 years ago might have been more positively disposed to undertake military service than if we posed the same question today. I think that is probably correct. But then, in these days, even knowing the great need, the huge manpower requirements that, that were there meant that not enough people were prepared to sign up to allow the size of forces to be marshalled that were actually required. So even when people were told, your country needs you, you know, it, it was them that were needed, and when so many people were prepared to heed that call, it still wasn't enough. And it's interesting to think, was it the prospect of war itself that put people off? That would obviously be quite understandable. Um, it, it was clear to everybody what a perilous position they, they would be going into if, if they joined the army. But I think that there was more to it than that. Uh, I would certainly be, be thinking about the concept of the country as an extension of yourself and how that fits into people's decision making here, both pre-conscription and during the time of conscription too particularly in the early stages where, you know, notwithstanding all the other circumstances, that will have felt like a new situation and a new thing for people to consider in what was already a, a very unstable situation with Britain being at war. And even though the very vast majority of the people that were called up did accept the call and they, they headed off very bravely to, to do their bit, it is interesting, and I heard a bit about this uh, when I came in, that there, there were those who opted not to do so. Uh, and I say opted, uh, clearly they had varying degrees of success uh, in that venture. I had a, a bit of a look at that and, and I thought it was very interesting to read 
some of the stories of, of people who had said, no, I'm going to stand fast and I'm not going. Um, in my area of the world, which is where I particularly looked at, they, they represented a, a very varied bunch uh, with some very interestingly diverse reasons uh, that they gave for not wanting to serve. Um, I, I did feel a little bit of sympathy, perhaps, for Will Fife, who was a popular entertainer, and, and he tried to persuade uh, that he was better placed to sing to the troops <laughs> than to join them. Um, and the tribunal <laughs> listened to this felt it was not the case. He would not be a tonic for the troops. And they sent him off to the front anyway with his tail between his legs. But he, he survived uh, uh, and he wrote the classic song, or it's classic where I come from, uh, I Belong to Glasgow. Uh, but, and clearly his sense of belonging to Glasgow was, was so great that uh, he, he preferred to remain there. I think that's it's quite interesting and you know, it becomes quite personal when you, you get down to that. But, but on a maybe more considered note, um, Arthur Woodburn also refused to fight um, because he had deeply held pacifist beliefs, which I think certainly must be respected. And he was sentenced to hard labour for his troubles. Um, but very interestingly to me, because I think that must have been quite controversial at the time, his stance didn't stop him later being elevated to the position of Secretary of State for Scotland. So that gave me some pause for thought, because in terms of the attitudes at the time to, to people whose beliefs were so deeply rooted in personal principles, there must have been a little bit more flex than I had anticipated. So it's interesting that the, the, uh, he, he did um, see that the situation in the world was, was such that he wasn't prepared to... Uh, go forward. I think for most people at that time, they saw the, the situation in the world and felt that perhaps it was their duty to go forward. Or perhaps for most people, I think they, they possibly felt that there was no alternative. Um, it's not presented or it wasn't presented at the time as an option. You know, you, you, you can be called up or, or you can not. You know, if you're being conscripted, that, that was that. So they quite possibly did feel a sense of duty, uh, a sense of wanting to do their, their bit for the, the country. Uh, but I think that the way that the government understandably presented things as they did, will have led most people to the understanding that this was entirely compulsory and that there was no alternative open to them or no palatable alternative open to them in any case. But what about now? You know, how, how would we fear, fear if, if we were posed with the same question, if it was today? You know, would people feel that the Westminster Parliament here had the right to say to them, off you go to war? Um, and, and obviously that is quite difficult to say because we are not involved in that kind of conflict just now. But I suspect there would be a, a huge reluctance amongst the general population to accept a move to conscription, a move to compel people to fight. Uh, what is impossible, I think, to predict is how people might react if we were feeling under direct threat and in a situation where military personnel were not sufficient to the job of defence. And then that moves you on to the, the question of military capacity, and I think that that does have to come into the, this kind of debate to some extent, um, recognising that a theoretical need to call up the population for backup would have a very direct relationship in terms of the numbers of regular and reserve forces that you had in, in your armed services. But we are very far now from the days of national service, and, and people my age certainly have no direct memory of it. And I think that matters when you look at this subject too, because it is alien to most people in our communities that we could be compelled to fight and compelled to die uh, for a country. And it does lead to some quite fundamental questions. Uh, topically, for me anyway, uh, perhaps, is you know, what is our country? You know, are we prepared to take collective responsibility for it in this very direct and potentially very final way. Maybe it might depend on the reason why we're asking, and I, I think it probably does. Um, I, as we've seen, and I, I've certainly done it myself, citizens protested in, in their millions against the war in Iraq. It is reasonable to think that other conflicts might provoke similar sentiments and that there could be a divergent and, I, I guess, divergent and very firmly held opinions on whether a conflict in itself was right, even before you get to the question of compelling service. And that isn't, I don't think, to say that we have become more pacifist. I'm not sure, actually, whether we have or not. Uh, but I think perhaps we've become more polarised and certainly more empowered. Uh, I'm confident that, as well as people who may hold traditionally pacifist views, we would see many more people who had a principled objection to a specific conflict. And I think that there would be those who were simply not prepared to put themselves into peril in this way and some more who, perhaps more passively, just wouldn't go. 
So I, I already gave a, a health warning about none of us being in a position to predict the next uh, political move domestically or, or further afield. But that notwithstanding, unless there was a huge change in society and in the external in environment we're operating in, I struggle to imagine a scenario nowadays where conscription would entirely wash with the population. Uh, I wouldn't be in a hurry to vote for it. Uh, and what about the military? Um, even if we were to accept, and I'm not entirely convinced of this, that your country has got a right to compel you to fight, because that, you know, that is a valid argument to, to look at. Would the army want to have a group of reluctant soldiers? Uh, I think there'd be a, a world of difference on the battlefield between those people who are prepared to be there and have made that decision, even if perhaps that wasn't their ideal scenario, and those who simply don't want to do it. If you were a soldier, would you want to team up with someone with such questionable motivation? Could you rely on them to have your back? And the military, as it stands now, is a professional fighting force. How, how would they welcome and, and how would they be expected to welcome <coughs> ranks of untrained and sometimes reluctant civilians joining their highly trained professional forces? And again, it might be that we could only truly answer that in terms of a specific point in time. And in this, this day and age, I, I do think surely conscription would go against the green in terms of the way that we conduct conflicts. Uh, I have a particular interest in, in drones in terms of the parameters of their use and, and also in relation to the human impact. And obviously drones do need an operator, but the direction of travel in terms of military capacity has moved significantly to a much less manpower oriented framework and I think to a much more strategic and professional focus. So I think the other question that we should maybe ask ourselves is whether the military as it stands now, as a professional fighting force, would welcome these ranks of untrained and, and reluctant uh, civilians joining their forces. And I think that the final thought for me, because I, I know that we do have a, a panel discussion to, to come, is that I do think that there is a, a public recognition today of the job that our armed services do. Uh, I, I think that there is a largely held respect for the work of armed forces personnel. And I do wonder, uh, to, to conclude, if that respect to some extent is because many of us recognise that we simply wouldn't be up to or wouldn't be prepared to do the job that we ask them to do. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, before I open up to questions, though, just, just following on from that, I just wondered if any of our panellists can envisage a situation in which conscription would be required, would be needed. In other words, if there was a if there was a, a, a crisis in the country that would require conscription, I know it's sort of crystal ball glazing, uh, gazing to some extent, but well, can you even think? Uh, of no, I, I think it's that's right. Even in nineteen sixteen, it was so difficult, and uh, uh, um, so many forces making it not so difficult there. I do think, having said that, we are at a particular moment in. Uh, dramatically changing moment in world history, and I think the issues of defence of Europe and therefore Ireland have are changing rapidly. That's what this presidency does mean. The questions we pose in a different way, and therefore I actually do think that um, we are the ways that we have thought about this or these problems. That's why Sweden, etc., as the case is referred to, is to introducing conscription. The ways that we have traditionally thought about these problems, i.e., not very much, uh, um, is, is we're, we're, we're now in a, for good or for ill, just a, this is a break in history, and we're now in a new place. I find it very hard to believe that conscription is uh, in any way, as I say, so difficult. Now, as, you know, Liberal Party splits and so on in 1916. Uh, I don't believe that's, a, but I do think of the issues of um, it, it, different types of engagement with our defence and more popular engagements with our defence are really, will come back into the agenda now. And, and just on that example you gave of Sweden, which is, uh, in theory, at least a neutral country, it's because of Russia, isn't it? That mm. it's, it's, yeah. so, so, so what about you? Do you think there's a, a scenario in which Britain would, 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 would call up people to so. Well, it kind of, you know, the, the, it's where your island status is, is significant. I mean, the, Julian and I, we were on the Defence Committee at some stage where I was concerned. I could not understand why ev every defence review of this country ought to say, we are an island. Absolutely. Therefore, the most important thing is our Navy. And then you go on and say, an occasion we might be attacked by there, so then it's their force. And, and actually, the army is mm. the third optional uh, in that sense because it's, it's an expeditionary force of choice. Mm. 
So I think for, for continental European countries, we've got the, the Russians rather in the, in, in the current situation, I can understand it. But I, I'd find the circumstances which would lead these days, and also I think Kirsten made a very important point of, of, of the nature of warfare. I mean, it was interesting that when, when our troops fought in Afghanistan, I remember when the debate came about bayonets on, 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 on soldiers' rifles, you know, some of our military guys were saying we hadn't quite realized that we were going back to a kind of warfare which we never thought we'd have to do again. Uh, but to, to, to make that jump to the British Isles and conscription, uh, I hope that not only is my imagination <coughs> insufficient, but so is history. Maybe I'll spend Well, I, I, I'm not, it's, it's not quite answering the question, but it's a, the central, the central issue is that we may well find a time when we need much larger armed forces. And the thing that worried me for years and years, and even brandished one or two answers to written parliamentary questions that showed, proved it, is that we went through a whole period where a vague idea that we might one day an extremist go for conscription had completely been allowed to close down the real questions as to how we were going to expand again quickly, which can only be done if you're in a non-conscript country through having credible reserves. And actually, I think we've only taken the first step on that. I think it's preposterous that, that I can say it's a backbencher, that our reserves are still such a tiny proportion of the total. We, we in other English-speaking countries and in our own past, we saw having a really substantial framework so you could regenerate a large force again um, as, as being absolutely central to defence. And it also ties into Giza's point about the, about the Navy. Giza and I were the two who actually said, how can it actually be that we produced a national security statement as we did that didn't mention anywhere that we were an island? If the Navy is going to come first, then the consequence which of that is, certainly is no, which yeah. is, well, just beginning to get it back yeah. towards where it should be, but for a very long time, it was the poor relation of the three, which is extraordinary. Um, the consequence has to be, I mean, I'm for spending more money on defence, but the consequence has to be that you have to find affordable ways of delivering in the most manpower intensive service, and I'm, you know, third generation on the car keys. So. <laughs> It's interesting the way that the discussion has gone, actually, which is why I, I wanted to come in there, because I think that the, the fundamentals have to be right before you could think about the sort of additional layer of conscription, um, which, as I said, wouldn't be my choice. But um, it, it's interesting what you, you said about making sure that you know the reserves are in place. Yeah. I think the footprint has to be in place. And, yes. and without wishing to be political, because I don't want to be party political on this panel at all, that the military footprint is going... In, in, in a downward direction rather than than anything else. You know, the, the, the size of the Scottish coastline, I think, is particularly of interest to me. Uh, the, the fact that the installations are going to be reduced significantly is of particular interest to me. And I think that if we were seriously to, to ever be in the position of having to mount some form of defence, we, we would be in a very perilous situation because these fundamental building blocks won't be there. Can I open it up and um, if you can just give us your your name and just uh, your question, that would be great. And if you want to address it to anybody in particular. Um, I just want to turn the question slightly around and talk about that large proportion of our society who until recently didn't have the right to fight. Um, women weren't able to fight 100 years ago. And in fact, it's only two months since they were able to join frontline regiments and take part in close combat, in theory at least. Uh, and we'll see that develop. Um, this may be just symbolic, and we've probably gone past that in our, in our civilization, but from the time of the ancient Greeks forward, the right to take part in fighting was both the duty of the citizen and a way of winning citizenship for those who were up until that time disenfranchised. Um, we forget 100 years ago, I think a lot of us forget 100 years ago, that while women ran, got the vote there, 5.2 million men also got the vote, which completed pretty much universal adult male uh, suffrage. Um, men, through fighting in the past, way before our welfare state, um, won pensions, albeit periodically rather than consistently there. So I'd really like to ask Kirsten and, and Gisela in particular, 
whether they see women getting the right to take part in what's inevitably going to be just very small numbers in these close combat units is a symbol, just the tearing down of, a, of an anachronism, an irritation, or whether this actually is going to somehow today, in our current world, uh, strengthen and underpin women's citizenship. Well, I mean, it's interesting that when you go in an American aircraft carrier and you actually find it's run by a woman. Uh, and it's rather encouraging, and I thought it was good. You know, at one stage the Navy was saying, oh, we can't possibly have women on, 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 on the ships, and we can't possibly have them on the subs. Uh, and I, I do think within the forces they have moved to the point where it's a question of capacity. Uh, can you do it? Now, if I look at some of our special forces, uh, I'd say, you know, you either can do it or you can't. There's, there's a part of me which says it's, it's, it's actually not my, my, my idea of, of, of liberation to, to be allowed to be shot at. <laughs> <laughs> However, I think if that's what you want, certainly our services in, uh, today is, is, is of much greater quality. But you, you mentioned a bit on the citizenship. There's something very curious. Uh, when I was on the Defence Committee, there were particularly two people there. One was Penny Morden and the other one was uh, Bob Stewart who had, you know, were, were, were serving. And I remember whenever we went to any forces, or even going out to Afghanistan, something happened to their eyes, which could tell you that that's where they really wanted to be again. You know, there was a... So, so I, I, whilst I've never served in the forces, I could tell that those who have, it has given them something which is with them for the rest of their lives, and actually something quite precious. I think it's a really interesting question as well, and I think that's that's really interesting reflections from from Gisela. My personal view, um, a very strong view, is that there is nothing that women can't do, or that women shouldn't be allowed to do, uh, and I think that, that there should be no ifs or buts about that. Uh, clearly, there are some traditions where women have always been able to, to be warriors, if that is what they want, and I think that's a, an important question. No, no more should women be sent to fight against their will than, than men should. But I think that particularly in the world today, and we do find ourselves in very um, uncharted territory in many ways, it would be particularly um, unfortunate if women were constrained um, in any ways that they, they needn't be constrained. I think it is, of course, about a woman's right to choose if she wants to fight or not, but I think it speaks to the bigger picture as well. Did you have a particular view yourself? Um, I, I think actually it has been, sorry, uh, I think it has been important, um, even today, even though we've put many of these sort of uh, issues of women's rights and citizenship perhaps behind us, I think it still just further shores up. But I think it would be really interesting to see whether the panel and other people, in thinking about whether the country should make us right, we're envisaging women being conscripted in a future conflict. Right. Um, should we take another question? Sorry. Um, yes, madam. Sorry over there. You've spoken about a um, sense of national identity, the national will. Um, if there were to be an incursion by the uh, Russians into a Baltic state, do you think that our nation would perceive that as so fundamental and important to our own security that we would uh, want to be able to engage in conflict? And if necessary, um, people should have to pitch in and be conscripted, if it came to it. So the scenario was in the Baltics, was it? So should, should it say you, we here in the UK, be conscripted to fight, in the, to fight for the Baltics, if, if necessary? If, if there were to be an incursion yeah. by Russia into okay. a Baltic state, yeah, yeah. Do you, does the panel think that uh, this nation would feel that that was uh, an appropriate conflict okay. to um, compel our citizens to fight in if it became necessary. So it's a sort of Article 5 NATO treaty question. So, Mulby, what do you say to that? Well, I think it's a, because it's become more, considerably more likely, I think. I mean, it, it, if the moment that we're in is, is one in which it's very hard to predict, but lots of people <coughs> by President Trump's policies, high protectionist, high not protectionist, etc. But there's one thing I think is absolutely clear, which is this is not an idle bromance with, with, with Putin across the airwaves that it will have policy significance for Syria in the first instance. And I don't think there's any thought, I mean, real policy <coughs> that 
decisions are going to be have to be made by this country in that context. Although I think I guess the outcome of those decisions, uh, um, given the dominance of the United States in, in these matters. But then the question becomes, the question becomes if, you, if you assume that you we're going to have a different American policy in Syria, uh, a different relationship with the Russians, what next? And the question then becomes, is this a presidency which says to the Russian effect, all right, Georgia, Ukraine, that's over. Uh, uh, um, but you have to be very careful what you do next. <coughs> or indeed, whether or not for the Russian elite these wins are enough. That's the point. We, so we're, we're at a point where your question is a damn sight less hypothetical than it was not that long ago, <laughs> if, I, if I can put it like that. I actually believe that I, I, I still think Gisela's right. I think, it, uh, uh, except under far more extreme circumstances than that, from our point of view, uh, I don't think we'd see conscription I, I, or introduced. Uh, I do think, as Swedes and other countries are showing now, is that there is a greater need to can think about defence, um, and uh, it, it, all, many European countries have massive problems about how they've adapted, how they've changed culturally, how little they spend. And the Americans actually have a point uh, that, you know, we should, if, if we're serious about this, it's, 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 it's our responsibility. But your questions are real, but that's the point, much more close to imminent realities or possibilities, not possibilities, but I'd say rather than realities than it, than it was a, a, few, a, a few months ago. But even so, uh, I, I don't, I think you just can't see you can see massive division in this country, just as there has been over every, as there was over a massive, massive division, and it's nothing to do with us, and you know, and so on. Putin's not such a bad guy, which actually, from some point of view, I can understand all these arguments. But, um, well, have you got a view on this one? I think the experts will know more about it, but I suspect that um, the whole thing would be over by the, by the time we've sort of. Conscripted people, <laughs> trained them, got them into the army, yeah, yeah. divided them into units, all this sort of stuff. Forget it, really, I, th I fear. Um, so I think the answer is no. Um, can, can I add something? You see, I cannot see us, with the exception of the defense of some of the British overseas territories, that we would do anything on our own. So you would always be part of an alliance, uh, and arguably, there, there was a question, was the cyber attack on Estonia uh, a, a, an attack? And NATO is quite deliberately fudging the question as yeah. to when does cyber, I mean, in the Wales summit, it was quite clear that they were desperate not to talk <coughs> about it, uh, whether that would trigger it. So I think it's a kind of combination of it would be in combination with others, where probably the manpower wouldn't be the key thing of, of, of such numbers that you would think about conscription. Uh, so it's a real question, but probably we would bring something. It's a bit like in Waterloo. We couldn't, we couldn't actually bring enough soldiers, so we pay for them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's... Um, I rather agree with what... what I mean, it, it is, you, your question goes to the heart of the very frightening era that we're in at the moment. You put four or five things together. The decision to bring under Article 5, which has been the cornerstone of our security since the Second World War, a group of countries that are a very long way away and extraordinarily difficult to defend. You then put into the mix an American president who is loathed by half his country but actually is speaking for almost every single person in America when he is, says that he's absolutely fed up with Europe um, freeloading on America for it to pay for its defence. Um, and um, you have a very, very dangerous situation there indeed. Um, I think it's right that we're reinforcing the Baltic states. I think it's right that we're ready there. And clearly, um, if Article 5 is called, I mean, as Giza says, the American, it was both Giza and the said the Americans will take the decision. But um, uh, like Will, I, I, I suspect the, conscription, the ideas about conscription would be pretty academic. Yeah. But, uh, but, oh, sorry, last point, but we, the consequences of it will be that at that point we will have to ask some very, very searching questions about defence. If, if I can maybe 
look at a different bit of the question, first of all, that you asked, because you, you started off with national identity, and I thought that was really interesting, because I suspect, and I have no idea where, where people in the room have come from, my national identity, for me, might be slightly different to the, the way that other people perceive their national identity. But I think that the, the key thing is that the concerns for other countries and the area of the world that you're talking about particularly would be no less, but my particular interest in Scotland's coastline would be more because it's in such a key strategic position in, in Northern Europe, and I think that you know the proximity uh, becomes much more of a, uh, a concerning issue in that situation. So, I, I do think, however, that if we did get to the point of looking at conscription to deal with issues in that area of the world, then we would have some very searching questions to be asking ourselves about conventional forces and why they weren't of a sufficient level, because I think that, as Gisela said, we would clearly be looking at partnership approaches uh, with, with others. But the, the key sort of element of the geography of the situation is of particular interest to me. I think that you certainly have, have touched on a, a point of concern, uh, and I was really um, interested in Lord Rue talking about a bromance. I think that's a word I didn't expect to hear uh, here, but I, I think that it's, it's important, and I think we're all watching that with um, some concern. Sorry, yes. This lady in the front row, thank you. Hi, my name is Linda Corsha. Thank you. My name is Linda Corsha. Um, is that on? Yeah. yeah. Um, much of our military engagement over the last few years has actually involved interface with is Islam. And so I'd be interested in what you think of how that, that could work with um, conscription in this country. And um, Sorry, could you just spell that out? What, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean that we have a, a significant uh, number, particularly of young people, who are Muslim in this country, right? right? So you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about where there's that sort of interface, um, could conscription work in that okay. sense, you know, okay. or, or what would it entail? Um, and the other point is, it seems to me that there is a shift towards um, paying mil uh, mercenary soldiers. Um, for instance, I, I believe that a big part of the US forces in Iraq was uh, a mercenary force. Uh, from various places. Uh, so what do you think about that in relation to conscription? Right. I, I just wonder whether the word mercenary might mean contractor there because I think, you know, when the US goes to war, they take about, you know, it's five contractors plus for every one soldier. So did you mean con uh, a mercenary or did you mean a contractor in that? Well, I mean, it's not, um, that might, the, there seems to me a difference of that you go fighting for your country as a professional soldier, but also it's your country, or you're a paid soldier from anywhere. Okay. Well, Julian, can, we, can, we, can you ask you, answer the first part of that question, which is about, um, which I think is, is a current issue in that uh, we know that the head of the army, General Sinek Carter, is very keen uh, to encourage uh, more British Muslims to join the yeah. army. It, I mean, it's absolutely critical, and the Chief Defence Staff actually has an Islamic advisor. We have a number of a small number of Muslim chaplains, but we, but he has a um, a chief, uh, I think, who, who is um, and who did a lot of uh, extraordinarily brave stuff in Afghanistan, unprotected, going out and talking to uh, various uh, muftis there and so on. There's a tremendous effort to try to re increase the um, proportion of people from ethnic minorities in the army, which actually has fallen because we've stopped Commonwealth recruiting or reduced it to a tiny crickle. And getting more British people from ethnic minorities is critical, and the Muslim community is particularly critical. It's also quite hard to reach um, for a number of reasons. The uh, greatest success with recruiting ethnic minorities has tended to come from those who are in communities that are already well uh, well integrated, i.e. where there's a, there are any small proportion of the total and, they, and they, they have more of a sense of belonging, it's much, much harder to recruit people out of groups who are, if you like, inward looking and all, all uh, together, as quite a large proportion of the Islamic community is. I mean, I... I, I don't think about yeah. uh, well, I, don't, I, I think um, conscription would... Uh, would clearly have to apply to everybody. You look at the issues the Russians had with conscript Islamic soldiers in Afghanistan. 
Uh, but the fact is, if we had conscription, it would have to be universal. But I think the more immediate challenge is we need to get more people from, uh, at the moment the army is still, whatever it is, 92% white. We have to, more people from ethnic minorities, and the Muslims particularly important because of, of what we're doing. Just on, very quickly on your point on contractors, we are absolutely committed to contractors play, paying a key role of the defence effort, as it has in every previous war. The Merchant Navy had much heavier casualties than the Royal Navy in the last war. And um, we had, um, it, it, and even in, in the Falklands War, we had dock, dockside mates, as the Navy called them, people from um, naval suppliers and so on, more or less under the radar, on, deployed on warships, because they were doing last minute fitting out. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to perhaps take some issue with, with how you characterised that. Uh, you, you said that, that we were in conflicts um, and we were in an interface with Islam, uh, and I think that's wrong. I don't think that that's what the situation is at all. I think that in these conflicts we're in an interface with terrorists, and that's a very different thing. Uh, and I think it's useful because we, we did start by looking back 100 years to, to look back, and you know when we were in that position 100 years ago, there were Sikhs, there were Muslims, mm. there were Hindus. I marched on Remembrance Day on Sunday with uh, the, the Jewish veterans in my local community. The army is not, and neither are any of the services, as diverse as I would like them to be. I think that we have some way to go. I think it is crucial we get there. I believe uh, General Sir Nick Carter, um, when he says that he has yes. plans um, underway to, to improve things, and I think that these things are certainly having effect, but I think that it's absolutely vital that we don't characterise this as fighting Islam, we're fighting terrorists, yeah. that's a reasonable thing. Fighting Islam, that's something else and it's a road we should never be going down. I didn't say that. You said it was an interface with Islam. Well, I, think yeah. we, I, think we, I think we've cleared that one up. Um, I'm sorry that we have run out of time and uh, it's partly my fault for asking a question so you can give me a kicking at the end <laughs> of this. But um, just like to thank all our panellists and just, uh, just to draw out some of the sort of um, main points and um, hopefully I'm not going to misrepresent the thrust of what you were saying but from Lord Bew we heard the Irish illustration, the difficulties uh, of conscription um, in the First World War um, and not just because of that sense of nation but also because of issues like class, snobbery, the old uh, British problems and clearly an Irish problem too. Um, Gisela uh, told us about how conscription can be used for the dangers of using a conscription as suppression um, and also the need for a national consensus when, 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 it is, when it is going to be used, if it's going to be used. Uh, Julian uh, said that conscription I think was morally justifiable but uh, soldiers are better when they're volunteers I think was the thrust of it. And Will, the country has a right to ask you to fight, but not an absolute right. Um, and then, Kirsten, <coughs> you sort of brought us to the, the current times about the questions of, uh, of uh, when people would answer that question, the Kitchener poster, your country needs you. Um, but also, I think, highlighting the point about, you know, these are very different times that you're not going to get, you know, when in, in, the, in, in the First World War you needed manpower. Today's fighters have to use very complex weapon systems um, and you're not going to train somebody in a couple of weeks. But um, I'd like to thank all our panellists for contributing to this debate and if we can just show them our appreciation. In the Ladies and gentlemen, my final thanks today are to, again, our panellists. Thank you very much for taking part, and Jonathan for chairing so wonderfully. Um, thank you to uh, Portcullis House and to the Houses of Parliament for hosting us, and thank you all very much for attending. Um, I wish you all a pleasant evening and a safe journey home. Thank you very much. Thank you.